Hello everyone and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry, a fan channel where everything Dragalia Lost can be found. In today's video, I'll be talking about the Twinkling Twilight event, I'll play through Astral High Midgard Swarmer, and basically just want to give some feedback since this is our second ever Onslaught event and I think the Dragalia dev team definitely improved certain things compared to our first Onslaught event, United Front, a couple months ago. And I think there are still some things that can be improved in the future. So I wanted to make this video as a way of discussing that and also just to have a video out there about this event. I don't want to overlook it even though it is kind of a filler short event, but uh, nonetheless I think that it had a pretty cute story. It introduced some alts of fan favorite characters, and so I feel like there's a lot of positive to say here as well. So let's go ahead and get into the event page. Obviously this event introduced Yukata Cassandra and Yukata Curran. It's another Onslaught event. Our first one was Nadine and Linnea's United Front. And one of the things that this event did much better, in my opinion, compared to the previous Onslaught event, is that the progression and the grinding was overall much smoother, and you had to farm considerably less than in the first event. So we kind of got a taste of this with last month's defensive battles, which has a very similar structure to the Onslaught events. But basically, they made it so that each of these stages in the event, you really only had to do each quest one time total, and you could immediately move on to the next stage. So you didn't have to repeatedly farm the previous stage just to unlock the next stage as you did the first time this was around. So already the day one play experience for this was 100% better. It meant that you didn't have to farm out the previous difficulty like 20 times to unlock the next difficulty, you could just progress through one level at a time. So that's something I have to give a lot of props for. At the same time, we kind of expected that to be coming because that came in the defensive battles that we got last month as well. So the second thing that they changed from a gameplay standpoint is they added this Astral High Midgard Stormer Assault, which costs a stratagem to play there was an interesting story actually about the Great Worms and uh, their High Dragon forms, Astral Awakening. It kind of reminded me that we don't actually know a lot about the Astrals and the fact that they're kind of manifest memories in this world. So that could actually be a rich avenue in the future if they decide to flesh out what the Astrals are or how they work a little bit more. I'm not necessarily expecting that, but I do expect in future Onslaught events we'll get other hide dragons in these astral forms and have to battle them as a dragon. So what surprised me about this, and I'll show you, I suppose it'll default to who I used in the past. I guess this is what I used. I want to say I may have switched to Gala Mars now that I have him, but I have heard Apollo is pretty effective for this. So let's go ahead and try it out and we'll turn off autoplay so we can kind of enjoy this. We'll turn on uh, some of the camera shake features and whatnot that are pretty exciting when you're in a dragon battle but are a little less convenient when you're in an endgame battle. So we'll do all of that. What surprised me to hear about this was this was a pretty big sticking point for players. Like this was a significant challenge for some players. I kind of didn't notice this and I think it has to do with stat creep on gear where the gear I had just made this probably considerably easier than it's going to be for players who don't have that same level of gear. My expectation would be that with Chimera Tech weapons, this wouldn't be too hard, but uh, it was apparently pretty hard for some players, so I just want to acknowledge that. But basically, with somebody like Apollo, you have a lot of leeway to just dodge and just stay away from Midgard Stormer's attacks altogether. And uh, we're dealing decent damage. He's going to start spitting these wind balls at us, like he does in his normal High Dragon trial. I shall rend you and then he does this 8-way blast. He's going to dash at us. Oh, I guess he's going to Trident Tempest. But those are essentially the only moves he does. He doesn't actually use Tattered Sky, uh, nor will he summon Golems or anything like that. So we're able to just kind of dodge and play Keep Away, especially with a dragon like Apollo who has such reach. But you also want to not overcommit into doing something when you'll get punished. But yeah, essentially this is what this fight is. It, it's a little bit longer in duration if you have a weaker dragon. So I could see it being pretty hard uh, if that's the case for you. 
But it's simple, yet I think it's something fun that they added to this. It, oops, we got hit there. It definitely made for some interesting videos people were posting of trying this with uh, all sorts of dragons, mini mids, some of the three star dragons, golden Fafnir. So that's kind of cool. That, that added something a little fresh to this event. But at the same time, I think it's still safe to say, and it'll probably remain this way for a while, that these Onslaught events and likewise the defensive battle events are kind of filler events. And uh, that's sort of the intention. I mean, it would have otherwise been a down week and Dragalia lost. But what surprised me is that I'm really starting to prefer the story in these filler events to the story in the larger events, despite the production value that the larger events have. And so that's kind of one of the next things I wanted to talk about was the story this time around. It was very short, very simple, but I kind of appreciated the brevity after playing through Doomsday Getaway and ended up not making a video really to talk about the Doomsday Getaway story in part because by the time I had just gotten through it and recorded myself uh, reacting to all of it, I was so tired out by it, just the fact that it was quite long, and I think it was certainly meant to be played a day at a time, whereas I did it all at once. Oh, this actually happens in this fight? I didn't know this even happened. This is kind of cool. Uh, we'll get back to that thought in a second, but oof. We got punished there. I didn't actually know that happened if you uh, take that long in that fight. That's kind of cool. So it has a few more mechanics from Jaime Gordstormer's Trial than I even expected. But what I was going to say about Doomsday Getaway is that um, by the time I got to the end of it, even though every character sort of had a moment, it had this great music, high production value, I also felt like I didn't really feel very fulfilled at the end of that journey. Like there wasn't a lot that really added to the mystery of the main campaign or anything like that. Some of the best events, in my opinion, have had those kind of teasers at the end where at least you feel a payoff. In this case, there was something in the epilogue that hinted that maybe the mystery is not fully resolved. But um, for instance, in the Rhythmic Resolutions, it's another event where, kind of like with Carmen, I wasn't crazy about those gremlin type characters, like they were just kind of a pain. Um, so, but at the end of that event, there was a teaser of one of the members of, gosh, what are they called? I guess one of the Worm Clan leaders of Hinamoto the leader of the Ox Clan, and that the Marvelous Naoto works for or is a vassal to that leader. That was kind of a really nice tease. And uh, other events have kind of functioned in a similar way, like some of the Stirring Shadows type events, uh, the events with Heinwald, and uh, oh man, we, we got hit a second time at the end. That really punished us. So we lost a little bit of glory, but it's fine. Um, yeah, some of the events like Fractured Futures, they've had some really interesting implications. So I feel like if they're going to spend all this time, I really want to see that level of delivery in terms of relevance to what's going on. This felt cute, like, um, gosh, I'm blanking on the name. Doomsday Getaway felt cute, but also kind of irrelevant. And I didn't really feel like the, those particular characters needed to be there for the story. They all had sort of a moment but it felt like just a random mix of characters to me. And with Twinkling Twilight, I just felt like the smaller cast, like just having Curran and having Cassandra and Latna and Heinwald making small cameos, it felt very compact and very neat. And the moment at the end with her and Audric or the memory of Audric slash Aurelius was really nice. I mean, it was very simple, but really nice. It felt a lot more like some of the adventure stories in this game, which I think are done pretty well. So that's kind of how I feel about this story. In terms of the reward structure, I already mentioned how it's convenient that when you first start off the event on day one, you unlock everything very rapidly, one stage at a time. You don't have to repeatedly play anything. The other thing I want to mention is that just like with the defensive battles last month, they made it so that you're getting a lot more glory per run and I think they actually lined it up super well to where if you just do your dailies in this every day, you're going to be close to the 2 million mark by the end of the content. So if you just do your dailies, maybe spend your stratagems, do a little bit more of play, I'm pretty sure you can get to 2 million. And I'm definitely sure from an expected value standpoint, it's worth spending the honey to go to 2 million. 
So I like that about it. They've really lined it up in a much more convenient way, considering that this is more of a grindy kind of filler event. And again, we got the tomes, which is a really nice reward, as well as all the honey. I'm pretty sure I'm sitting on a ton of honey right now. Yeah, even a, a ton of ashes as well. And uh, at this point, I'm kind of just saving it for the anniversary or spending it as I like, because I really haven't felt super compelled to go out of my way to grind anything lately. But uh, overall, I was pretty impressed with Twinkling Twilight. There's room for improvement for sure, but considering the amount of time it cost me and what I feel like I got out of it, I feel like it was sort of, it was good. It was compact, it was neat. And uh, with Doomsday Getaway and Rhythmic Resolutions, I didn't really feel that same sense of satisfaction. It might be because those events lasted longer. Maybe I'm getting a little tired of the reading the story format. So I probably won't do that for the upcoming story chapter. I'll just maybe read the last few parts of it and give a small reaction. But I think I prefer to just give my reactions after the fact. It's a little bit neater and it's less exhausting trying to read everything and then formulate an opinion. But anyway, that's pretty much what I thought about Twinkling Twilight. So let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. I'm curious what you think about this event format. And uh, as for next month, I fully expect we'll get defensive battles in September. I honestly think they're just going to reuse the maps from Fire Emblem Crossover Part 2 instead of Part 1 like they did in last month's defensive battles. So I think it's a little too soon for them to have uh, fully adjusted and reacted to the fact that we're saying that we want new content, but uh, nonetheless, I think that that will be another fine filler event. I expect it to be really quiet until they drop a proper anniversary announcement of the anniversary content that's to come. And then maybe after that, this series of events will be refreshed a little bit and be a little more interesting. It's possible they'll just sort of stay how they are, and if that's the case, I don't mind. Some things that I think could make them a little bit more aesthetically appealing you know, if they replaced Yudin here with one of the event characters, maybe if they occasionally mixed up the background music. I mean, this background music's kind of generic, but it's okay. And obviously, if they mixed around with the position of things on the map, even if it's kind of the same progression, or like, maybe it's winter, and now everything's covered in snow, and it's a December onslaught event or something. Like, there are subtle ways that I think they could tweak it, but at the end of the day, I feel like it's a way of saving development resources, the fact that it's sort of stock and then they put that into the story and other content that is more high budget like the raids and facility events but yeah that's kind of what i think about twinkling twilight i guess i've said that a couple of times now that is going to do it for today's video everyone so hope you have a great day thank you so much for watching take care and i'll see you next time